Wow, awesome music. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. Welcome to Celebrate Recovery. My name is Lauren. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I got here because of problems with alcohol and a broken marriage. The purpose of Celebrate Recovery is to allow us to become free from life's hurts, hang-ups, and habits. By working through the eight principles of recovery based on the Beatitudes, we can and will change. We will begin to experience the true peace and serenity that we have been seeking. Through this program, we will restore and develop stronger relationships with others and God. Newcomers, if you are a newcomer, we welcome you. Um, this uh, program, uh, we were all newcomers at one time. So um, if you are, we welcome you and uh, we will have a program for you. I'll mention that later. A um, little housekeeping, uh, restrooms are right in this hallway over here. This is a non-smoking campus. If you do need to smoke, uh, we don't judge, but you'll have to exit and go out to the sidewalks. Now would be a great time. Please silence your cell phones if you have not. We have a literature table over here, actually two tables. Freya has all of our literature for our program, um, step study guides, um, Celebrate Recovery Bibles, journals of two sizes. Um, uh, we have books from uh, Johnny Baker and uh, lots of good stuff over there. That stuff I mentioned is sold at our cost. And the other table that we have is free literature, um, issue specific things that you may be interested in. So if you have any questions, Come on over and talk to Freya. Okay, so we also have Freya as our special announcement gal. Hello, Forever family. I'm a grateful believer, struggles with codependency and depression. My name is Freya. Glad to be with you all tonight. So I am happy to uh, silence cell phones. I'm happy to uh, announce again. Um, our announcements are about step studies, so, and we are just working on putting together a fun little ad that you guys will get to see of why we want to encourage you to come to a step study, um, but it really is uh, where all the stuff that we talk about on Tuesday nights, we really bring it home and work it into our, our life and our being Well, God's Spirit does that in us. So. Men, their step study's already started, but it's still open. So that is Thursday nights from 6.30 to 8, upstairs in room 212. That's the, the last one at the end of the hall. And then the women's step study is going to start the Sunday after April, uh, after Easter, I mean. That's April 11th. Um, downstairs from that, the, the last room on the corner, A118. And that'll be from 1 to 2.30 on Sundays after church. All right, that's the announcements. Thanks, Freya. Um, yeah, she mentioned that we did a little um, quick um, videotaping on the importance of or why step study would be good for you, and uh, the 10 or 15 seconds was not enough to really talk about how important that step study is. So if you need more info on it, see one of us with a placard, and we'd be glad to share that with you. Okay, so um, I forgot readers. Um, would you come up and help me read? Paul? Okay. Well, my buddy Paul is coming up here. Thanks, Paul. Okay, number one, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors that our lives had become unmanageable. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out, Romans 7:18. Number two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose, Philippians 2:13. Number three, 
we made a decision to turn our life and our will over to the care of God. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Romans 12.1. Number four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord. Lamentations 3.40. Number five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. James 5.16. Number six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. James 4.10. Number seven, we humbly ask him to remove all our shortcomings. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Number eight, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Luke 6, 31. Number nine, we may direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Therefore, if you are offering a gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Matthew 5, verses 23, 24. Number 10, we continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Number 11, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and power to carry that out. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Colossians 3.16. Number 12, having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself or you also may be tempted. Galatians 6.1. Through, Through God's, God's grace, grace, lasting change, change is, is possible. possible. Thank you, Paul. Okay, so this time of our large group, we would either have a testimony or we would have um, a guest speaker. Hi, everybody. Is this the mic I'll be using? I feel like a politician with more than one mic here, so I'm just going to concentrate on this one, if you don't mind. Can you hear me okay? Hey, I want to tell you, um, we are proud that Celebrate Recovery is part of the ministry of Quail Lakes Baptist Church. I, I love what you are doing, what the Lord is doing in and through you. And tonight, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, one of the great stories in the New Testament, and it's very timely because this coming uh, Sunday is Palm Sunday. And I want to review some of the details of Palm Sunday with you. I'm going to ask you if you have either your Bible or a phone with your Bible on it to go ahead and take that out and uh, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 19. If uh, you don't have anything to look at uh, as I read the passage and, and you follow along, you'll just have to trust me that I can read it accurately. I understand we're going out on YouTube. Is that right? Is, that, is it live? No. Okay. Tape delay. For those of you on tape delay, great to see you. I hope you hit share and allow your friends and, and family to hear the message tonight uh, as we share from God's Word. Let's pray together as we go to God's Word. Lord, we pray that uh, these words this evening would be your words. We pray that these thoughts would be your thoughts. We pray that the conclusions that we draw would be exactly what you want us to not only understand, but put into practice. So help us grow tonight, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Palm Sunday is the day when Jesus was publicly 
uh, acclaimed as the Messiah. We call it Palm Sunday because when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, along with a, a whole host of other pilgrims going up to the Passover feast, when he was coming into Jerusalem a, a, a week before the feast, uh, they put palm branches on the ground and their coats on the ground to welcome him. Now that is unusual in our, in our setting, but in, in the ancient Jewish tradition, that was the ceremonial welcome of a king. In other words, the king's feet should not touch dirt, neither should anything the, the animal that the king is riding. And so symbolically, we're already seeing uh, the people recognize Jesus as a king as he arrives. And the portion of the events that we're going to look at tonight from Luke chapter 19 take place as Jesus is cresting the hill of the Mount of Olives and he sees the city of Jerusalem before him as he's approaching the city. Luke, when he tells us the story of Palm Sunday and it's told in all four of the Gospels, Luke doesn't really tell us about Jesus entering the city per se. We get a snapshot of Jesus on the Mount of Olives, then we get this next snapshot, he's in the temple courts. But Jesus, as he, as he crests the Mount of Olives, he asks his disciples to go find him a donkey to ride so he can ride into the city. And you are meant to ask a question when you read that. Why would he do that? It's not a long walk. And Jesus is an avid walker. He walks all throughout the, the gospel story. And we never see Jesus ever ride an animal except for this moment. So why does Jesus, as he's walked with this procession of people all the way from, uh, from Galilee, why is he now asking for an animal to ride? And what he's doing, he's fulfilling himself, he's, he's positioning himself to fulfill a prophecy from the prophet Zechariah in Zechariah 9.9. And this is the prophecy about the Messiah. Zechariah, hundreds of years before this, said this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding a, on a donkey on the colt of foal of the donkey. Jesus knows that the people will remember that prophecy. He asks that the donkey be brought to him because he's putting all the pieces together. He's laying out in his very actions that the king that Zechariah was talking about is me. I'm the one that has, you have been waiting for all this time. And the people see that and the people get that. Look at verse 38 if you're looking at your Bible or your phone. Verse 38, this is what the people say as Jesus does that. They say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. You see, they get it. They see exactly what they've been waiting for. This is the king. And then Jesus does something shocking. Verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you, encircle you, hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. In the midst of this celebration, Jesus begins to weep. He crests the hill of, of Mount, Mount of Olives. He sees the Jerusalem before him, and he demonstrates the fact that his mind is not where the crowd's mind is. The crowd is rejoicing, but Jesus knows something that they've yet to realize, and that is he knows he's not going to a celebration. He's going to rejection, and he weeps right in the middle of the road. As he's riding the donkey, he's weeping publicly. Now, when a great man weeps publicly, 
when a well-known man, well man weeps publicly and a strong man weeps publicly, it is moving and startling. Maybe you've seen an interview on the news and somebody begins to tear up, 60 minutes or something, a probing question, and they begin to tear up and the camera zooms in, right? Because that's the emotional moment. And people begin to feel the emotion that he's expressing. And here Jesus is not just tearing up. The, the Greek there says he is an, letting out an outburst of emotion, weeping for what he sees. And it's over something specific. He says he's weeping over Israel's ignorance. Verse 42. If you had, even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace. You see, you're missing something vital, he's saying. You're missing something important. And what they were missing is what would bring them peace. He's weeping over the fact that his own people don't realize who he is. His own people don't recognize he's coming to give them redemption. That Israel and Jerusalem are unique among the nations and the cities of the world at this moment. God in human form is among them, fiddly, physically, bodily present. And in their ignorance, they miss it. And they will be held accountable for missing it. But why would they be held accountable for missing something that they're ignorant of? To answer that question, we need to explore the words that Jesus says. It is hidden from you what would bring you peace. And that phrase, what would bring you peace, shows up in another place where Jesus speaks. And that's Luke 14, verse 32. And in Luke 14, 32, it's phrased a little different. It's the exact same words but it's phrased, the terms of peace. See, you're missing the terms of peace. Jesus is willing to make peace, but only on his terms. True peace comes only on Christ's terms. And reality is they've heard the message of peace over and over again. They've heard it from the prophets. They've heard it from the scriptures. They've heard it from Jesus himself through his own teaching. In Luke 13, Jesus says these words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, it's not just that they're ignorant of the terms of peace. They have pushed the terms of peace away. They have ignored the terms because they have misunderstood who he is. The word made flesh, the culmination of God's revelation. And they have turned away from the terms of peace. And all of this brings a result, the end of verse 42. And now it's hidden from your eyes. This is what I want you to see. They have re rejected the terms of peace long enough that now the time has passed. There is no second chance. The terms of peace are now hidden from them. By who? By God himself. And Jesus realizes that Jerusalem will pay a price for pushing away the terms of peace. But he loves them, and so he weeps. Verse 43, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you, encircle you, and hem you in on every side. See, Jesus is crying because he recognizes the reality of what's coming. And what's coming, we would call judgment. See, in that passage, we see both the mind of God and the heart of God at work. He grieves over the fact that a day of reckoning is coming, but the day of reckoning will come. He grieves over the willful blindness of those who have seen him, heard him, and still reject him but the consequences of the rejection will happen. Verse 44, they will dash you to the ground and the children within your walls, they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. So, now a history lesson. 37 years after this day, there was a revolt in Israel that migrated to Jerusalem 
It was a revolt against the, against the Romans in AD 66. Rome responded with military force, and General Titus let, led the Roman army, eventually led, uh, lay siege on the city of Jerusalem. That siege lasted almost three years. Inside the city, it was devastating. There was starvation and famine. And by AD 70, the city was leveled by the Romans. Forty years from the day Jesus spoke this prophecy, Roman forces tore the walls down, they tore the temple down, they hauled the artifacts away off to Rome. Mo many of the population were killed, huge portions were enslaved, and after that battle, all that remained of the Temple Mount was the s a few steps on the south side, which you can visit today, and a section of the retaining wall on the western side that held up the dirt on which the temple was built. And we call that section today the Western Wall. It's where the Jews go to pray. Every word of Jesus' prophecy came true. Amid all of the joy of Palm Sunday, as he listens to the crowd sing his praises, he reminds us, down through the ages, that there comes a moment when it is too late. There comes a moment when judgment is already passed, and another chance will not be given. Jerusalem will not avoid this judgment. It's already been pronounced. Jesus' popularity will wane in this week. The majority of the people will rise up against him. The leaders will want him crucified, and the Son of God will be slain. But in the midst of all of this, Jesus is making it clear. Time runs out. And that's a message that we must pull forward 2,000 years to ourselves and recognize that in all kinds of situations of life, time runs out. We think there's always going to be another chance. There's always going to be another day. There's always going to be, you know, that moment when I can make it right again. I'll just go back again. That's not the message, and that's not the truth. There's a moment when the door of opportunity is closed. So you have to ask the question, why does Luke in, uh, include this? Palm Sunday is a happy day. Palm Sunday, we, you know, the kids wave palm branches and it's all, it's all good, it's all joy. But here we see a picture of a weeping Savior and, and an ominous, ominous judgment. Why here? Because the Holy Spirit who inspired Luke to write these words wants us to see God's emotion over judgment. The heart of God contains both, both justice and mercy. Jesus is not a statue. He's a real man. He cries. He gets a lump in his throat. Tears fall just like up for us. And on the road, he weeps for these people. Why? Because 40 years from that day, this will happen, and some of them will still be alive. And this day, it became too late. And Luke doesn't write this just to tell us about the doom of an ancient city, but to show us that Jesus comes with terms of peace for us all. He desperately wants us to accept those terms before it's too late, and he continues to offer terms today. Here are the terms. The Apostle Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians 5. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Paul is saying to us, the terms of peace are still being offered. Have you accepted the terms? What are the terms? Here are the terms of peace with God. Lay down your arms. Put away the weapons of pride and denial. Put away rebellion and self-sufficiency. Stop thinking that you don't need a savior and that somehow you can win a war against God. The terms of peace are reject the foolish idea that it's all going to work out in the end even if I reject a savior. The terms of peace are admit your defeat, accept your pardon, and gain forgiveness. Jesus went to the cross and took our guilt on himself so that God's justice could be perfectly served in love. 
Both are there and now risen from the dead. He rejoices over those who say, yes, I surrender to that love. But he still weeps when we reject his terms. And the tears that Jesus is shedding on the road to Jerusalem, he might be shedding for some of us here tonight watching on the Internet. The beating heart at the center of the gospel is that God loves us. He wants us to be saved from the destruction that will come if we don't make peace with him. And the reason that Jesus weeps over those who don't accept his terms is because he knows that those terms are crafted in love. He knows that we're just hurting ourselves when we push them away. Even though it might feel good for a while to do that, eventually it will be too late. The terms of peace are born in love. Time runs out. One author tells the story of a bright, sunny summer afternoon. The ice cream truck went by his house. So he went out front and he flagged down the, the ice cream truck. He heard the bells and he bought two ice cream cones, one for himself and one for his daughter. And he came around the house to the backyard to give his daughter the ice cream cone and he saw his daughter, who was playing in the sandbox, was sitting there eating the sand. Her face was filled with sand. Her mouth was filled with sand, sand all over her hands. And so what should he do in that situation? Should he say, say to himself, well, I guess she likes sand better and leave her to herself, eat both of the ice creams himself? Or should he do what a loving father does, teach her that there are greater pleasures than the pleasures we would cling to left to ourselves? Not just sand. Ice cream awaits. So he washed out her mouth. She wasn't happy about that. He washed the sand off of her fingers and off of her face, and he gave her ice cream. And the, the moral of the story is that our small perspectives of what is pleasure carry a limited vision. We think we do things on our own terms when we want to do them, and we call this pleasure, but eventually our pleasure cheats us. Our pleasure brings destruction. It is God's terms of peace that forever bring hope and joy and promise. His pleasures are better. Lay down your arms. Put away your weapons, those things you use to fight against God and put, push off his truth and recognize that when you surrender, what you're surrendering to is love more than you could ever imagine. Don't hear the words of hope that Jesus brings and say, well, it sounds emotional and I don't, like, I don't like getting emotional. Or don't hear about the miracles and say, well, I'm much more of a scientist than that. I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of intellectual. Or don't listen to the call of faith and say, well, it sounds like I'm going to need to change my behavior and I'm all about choice. Don't hem me in. All of that is rejecting the terms, is missing the visitation. And the message of this little piece of Palm Sunday is, there comes a time when God says it's too late. But it's not too late now. I don't know where you are spiritually, but I do know this. Hearing the gospel, the chance to say yes to faith, forgiveness, renewal in Jesus, means it's not too late for you. And if you haven't done that, now is the time to do that. My time is done. I'm going to close in a prayer. But the prayer that I pray is a prayer that if you are ready to say yes to Jesus' terms of peace and you know you have to do it, you can simply say in your heart, praying to God and expressing faith. And if you do that tonight, sometime tonight, talk to one of the leaders and let them know about the decision, because this is a new beginning. Time has not run out for you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And if you're watching at home, join me in bowing together in an attitude of prayer. And maybe there's someone here or someone watching who simply needs to say this. Lord Jesus, I surrender. I ask for your forgiveness. I pray that you help me because I know I'm a sinner and I don't want time to run out. 
Make me your child. Enable me to be in the family of faith and be born again. And God, maybe somebody's praying that prayer silently right here or somebody watching on the internet. And I know that even though we don't hear it, you hear it. And I pray that you respond in love. Give them an assurance that new beginnings are possible, that it's not too late. And remind us all that, God, your terms of peace are terms of love. Thank you for loving us that much. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mark. On behalf of the Celebrate family here, we thank you so much. Okay, once again, uh, if we have any newcomers here tonight, welcome, welcome. We're glad that you're here, and um, we will have uh, over here a Newcomers 101 meeting. If you are a newcomer and you're here tonight, just kind of wander over this way towards our uh, info table, and we'll meet up with you there. Okay, so we will end our large group tonight with uh, reading of the serenity prayer. And after a moment of silence, we'll get into that. God, grant me this serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Okay, so we'll meet back here at uh, 8 o'clock, and we'll break to our small groups. Amen. Thank you.